there's just something different about a 15 inch subwoofer. And this budget subwoofer right here punches well above its weight. So let's build an enclosure. I'm really excited about this build. I've never run a 15 inch subwoofer before. Looking at this NVX VSW 15, it's definitely a lot bigger than the 12s that I'm used to running. The advantage of running a 15 is the extra cone area. That extra cone area makes the sub more efficient. So it should play louder than a 12 inch version of the same subwoofer. Now, one thing to point out before I get deep into the build is that this is not one of those giant monster SPL subwoofers. The basket looks to be stamped steel and there is an NVX logo stamped into the basket. Notice these bins right here, those add strength. I really like these labels on the speaker terminals. There's no mistaking the positive for the negative and you know for sure that it's a dual four ohm subwoofer. Looking at it from the front, I think it looks fantastic. It's elegant and understated. I like the way the logo is the same color as the cone. It kind of blends in so you can barely see it. The power rating is in between 600 and 750 watts RMS, and that seems pretty consistent with the construction of this budget-minded driver. If you were to get a similar subwoofer from a more mainstream brand, you should probably expect to pay about 50% more for the same build quality and performance. So this thing definitely looks like it's gonna bring some excellent bang for the buck. Step one is to drop the TS parameters into WinISD and take a look at the expected performance. Typically, I like to make my enclosures a lot bigger than what the manufacturer recommends, which in this case is 2.7 cubic feet. I was originally gonna shoot for a three and a half to a four cubic foot enclosure for this driver because that gives a big increase in output, but you run the risk of exceeding X max, which will result in distortion, which is exactly what WinISD predicts. So in this case, I'm gonna play it safe and go with the smaller box that the manufacturer recommends. 2.7 net cubic feet tuned to 32 hertz. Definitely gonna need an infrasonic filter on this one. And that bump right there in the middle of the frequency bandwidth, a lot of that's gonna be taken out when you put a low pass crossover on this thing. While I'm sitting at the computer, I'm gonna go ahead and draw up some plans in SketchUp. I'll make those available right below the video down in my Teespring store. I always make up plans before I start cutting simply because I like to have the material cut down to manageable sizes when I buy it. Then I'll bring it home and break it down to size on the table saw. And hey, here's a tip for you. The less you move the fence on the saw, the better. The sides, port walls, braces, and the corner 45s are all gonna be the same height. So you wanna make all those cuts at the same time without moving the fence in between. Let's say I were to botch these cuts by setting the fence a 16th of an inch too short. Well, they would all be short by the exact same amount. The enclosure will be slightly imperfect, but all of the parts will still fit together. But if I cut the sides, then reset the fence to cut the port walls, I run the risk of making those a 16th of an inch too long. And that'll create an eighth of an inch gap, and that is probably big enough to be a huge problem. I call this the theory of consistent errors. For something like a subwoofer enclosure, a 16th of an inch measurement error is not going to hurt anything as long as that error is consistent. You get into trouble when the error is different for every cut or if you start stacking those errors. I'm lucky to have a good table saw, but I started out using a clamp-on edge guide. Those are cheap and effective, but the odds of making those kind of errors are a lot higher because sometimes you just cannot avoid resetting the edge guide. That's why I recommend a Craig rip cut for people that can't afford or don't have room for a table saw. Hey, let's do some router work. The next step is to use a circle jig to make the speaker cut out. I always make a test cut in some scrap material just to make sure I get a good fit. When using the circle jig, I like to make the cut in two passes. For this build, I'm gonna go with a double baffle so that I can recess the sub. The outside diameter of the subwoofer is about 15 and a half inches. I'm gonna make that outer cut out in the outer baffle about 16 and a half inches. Now is a good time to stop and do a dry fit to make sure everything goes together as planned. And then it's time to mark out the cutouts for the port and the brace. I'm gonna rough cut those with the jigsaw and then it's over to the router table to flush trim the brace.
I usually flush trim the port at this point, but I'm gonna try something different this time. Keep watching and I'll show you that in just a bit. Now the outside of the outer baffle is gonna get a round over and the inside of the outer baffle is gonna get a rabbit. That's gonna give me a place to tuck carpet later on in the process. While I have the rabbit bit installed, I'm also going to run it along the two side pieces again to have a place to tuck the carpet later on. The next step is to laminate the two baffles together. I picked up this glue roller on Amazon. It, it really cuts down on the mess when laminating pieces together. I'm using some clamps to make sure that the two pieces are square before I tack in some brad nails. After I glue the two baffles together, I'm gonna to hit it with some spray paint. This is an easy way for you to add some small custom touches to your enclosure. You can use paint or vinyl to add a splash of color here, or a different shade of carpet to add some contrast. This time I went with flat black because that's what I happen to have on hand. Now it's time to assemble the enclosure. I always start with attaching the back and the bottom, and then I hold everything in place with some clamps while I drive brad nails. I know that some people prefer to glue and screw. I prefer to use glue and brad nails. Maybe if I were making a really big enclosure or throwing a ton of power at the subs, I'd consider using screws but wood glue is stronger than wood and the mechanical fastener just holds everything in place while the glue dries. You can do all of this with clamps, it's just slow. I find it easier to combine the port and the brace into one assembly before installing them into the enclosure. And now is a really good time to go ahead and install your corner 45s before they're blocked by the port. I like to use a piece of scrap material as a spacer to make sure I have the correct port width, and then I clamp the assembly to the enclosure before flipping it over and driving brad nails into the underside of the box. Now I'm going to attach the top. Before I do that, I went ahead and spray painted the port black. Typically the top goes on last, but sometimes I like to mix it up a bit. Now I need to attach the baffle. There are several ways to do this. And when I laminated the baffle together in the earlier step, the thing ended up being an inch and a half thick and I don't have any two inch brad nails on hand. So I'm just gonna glue and clamp the baffle. According to the instructions on the bottle, on a warm, dry day, the glue only needs to be clamped for about 30 minutes. So I just clamped it all together and took a break to grab some lunch. Now that the glue is set, I'm gonna haul this thing over to the router table and use a big flush trim bit to clean up the port. This is the first time I've tried doing it this way, and this only works if you've got a really large surface on your router table. And there are two things. One, the dust extractor, it's pulling a really strong vacuum. That actually made it difficult to move the box around on the router table. And two, I'm using a two inch long straight bit and I'm routing out an inch and a half thick baffle and it struggled just a little bit. You could kind of hear the router bogging down some. But typically when I do this in, in multiple steps on each individual baffle piece, I end up copying imperfections from the inner baffle to the outer baffle. And this time I was routing against the smooth inner walls of the port. So this was the smoothest port I've ever made. So I'm gonna be doing this again. I also made a round over on the inside of the port that did not go as smooth. I'll show you that after I carpet the box, so keep watching. Now carpeting a box is not difficult, but it does take some practice to get it right. I've only carpeted about four or five boxes, and every time I do it, I get a little bit better. Now for adhesive, I find that I do like the 3M Super 77 and the Loctite spray adhesive. I'm not a big fan of the Gorilla Glue brand spray adhesive. The carpet is from Parts Express. I'll make sure to give you a link down in the video description to all the products that I use in this video. I like to roll the box onto the adhesive when I can and let the weight of the box lock the adhesive together. And here's the part that I remembered that I'm supposed to tape off the port and the baffle before spraying the adhesive. So I had to stop carpeting in order to do that. From here, it's just a matter of pressing the carpet to the box and cutting out the holes for the speaker and the port. The 
The sides are the hard part. I found this knife on Amazon. It's my favorite tool for carpet. It has breakaway blades. I just break the tip off when the blade gets dull. Plus it has this cool pry bar on the other end that's perfect for pressing carpet into grooves. Again, I'll make sure to give you a link down below. On to the exciting part now. I'm gonna drop in the terminal cup and wire the voice coils into parallel for a two ohm load. And as I drop the driver in, you can see the goof that I mentioned earlier. When I cut the round over, I had the bit in too deep. So I've got this little blemish right here in the port. It shouldn't cause any problems, it just doesn't look good. Other than that one goof, this is the cleanest carpage edge that I've ever managed to put on a port. Yes, I did pre-drill my holes. Technically, this is called a pilot hole. I've had one viewer in particular always correct me when I say pre-drill instead of say pilot. So I'm trying to do a better job of saying pilot hole because that is the correct term. Let's hook up the dats and check the tuning frequency before we do some SBL testing. It came back as 30 hertz. Every time I use the dats, I end up getting about two hertz lower than WinISD's prediction. And now it's time for the fun part. Let's see how loud we can get. I picked up this SPL meter a few months ago just so I could provide you with some hard numbers whenever I test out a subwoofer. And I wanna point out that my current setup is not optimal for SPL. Throwing a sub on the back seat is about the worst possible way to test a subwoofer. But unless I wanna pull the seat out, this is my only option and I have contemplated removing the seat so here's what I'm gonna do I posted a poll on my patreon page and I'm gonna let my supporters decide if I should go full Leroy Jenkins and yank out the back seat so if you've been thinking about joining me on patreon now's a good time to sign up so that you can voice your opinion I want to say thank you to all my patrons to give an extra shout out to my $25 patrons Bo, David T, Bam Bam, Dylan, and Baba and how about those SPL numbers. I was pretty impressed. What about the sound quality? There's just a difference between the sound quality of a 15 versus a 12. And you can see from those SPL results relative to the 12s that I usually test on this channel, the difference that the extra cone area gives you. Well, you've seen the meter. None of the single 12s I've tested have ever broken 130 dB, and this big 15 did that no problem. Plus, it played louder at lower frequencies. And that extra low end umph really made a huge difference in the sound of this subwoofer. Everything just hits differently. It even seems to rattle completely different parts of the truck. One big upside of this particular 15 is the enclosure size. It's not that much larger than you might need for a 12. Plus you get extra power handling and more efficiency from that larger cone. So you can give up just a little bit more space and get a ton of extra bass by bumping up to this NVX 15. If extra bass is something you like, then click right here. You'll enjoy this video. I'm the DIY Audio Guy and I will see you on the next adventure.